Michael Lee does a fantastic uh, job covering the league, senior writer for the Athletic NBA, and a great follow on Twitter, at Mr. Michael Lee. Kind enough to join me on a Wednesday on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Michael, good to talk to you again, my friend. How you been? I've been great. Thanks for having me. Well, we appreciate a couple moments. Let's start in our backyard with the Philadelphia 76ers. And in spite of Embiid's comments from time to time, this team right now is playing winning basketball. Um, They look sharp. You know, I think a lot of the Brett Brown on the hot seat, that's kind of subsided a little bit with the 19-9 start. Is is Embiid's comments, you know, regarding the trade with Butler and trying to get more in the flow of the offense, his numbers are down a little bit. Is that much to do about nothing, or do you foresee this being an issue going forward? Um, it'll be an issue if he doesn't regain his rhythm, and I think that's more of a responsibility for Brett Brown than it is for Jimmy Butler. Um, I think that, you know, when they made the trade for Jimmy, I think the initial concern was how it's going to affect Ben Simmons. And they've gone out of the way to sort of make sure that Ben is engaged and involved, um, you know, in the post and in other areas to sort of, you know, expand his game because he's not going to take a jump shot. And I think in some ways they've kind of forgotten about the fact that MP was carrying them with MVP-level performance early in the first part of the year. So I think it's a natural adjustment. I mean, they don't have a training camp. They didn't have any sort of period to get ready. It's like mid-season trades are always going to be an adjustment. So I don't think it's necessarily a problem right now. I just think it's good that Embiid expressed it and he felt comfortable enough to say that he was frustrated with how things were going. Um, But I think that it's not a concern unless it becomes a problem that lingers. Um, I think the fact that he called it out, you know, early on in the process, um, gives them time to sort of fix it so that it so won't be a problem, a bigger problem down the road. Uh, listen, as I mentioned, they're 19-9. and They had two nice uh, back-to-back wins against the Pistons. Obviously, they've struggled going up to Canada and taking on the Raptors. We'll get to them in a second. Um, do you like the makeup of the Sixers right now as presently constructed? I mean, can you see them... Uh, and I know it's early. We're only 28, 30 games in the NBA season, but do they have some sustainability? Or do you think they need to go out and get another shooter out to the bench? I knew the minute they made the Butler trade, they needed another piece. Um, that wasn't going to be the last piece to help to get them over the hump. You know, you can always use more shooting, you know, and that's one of the things that uh, I think they're going to have to address. And they're going to need to get some more backup bigs. Um, you know, not necessarily – uh, like a bruiser, but just somebody who can maybe stretch the floor and just sort of give them, you know, um, some energy boost. So I think that if they can get a shooter and then some more depth in the front court, uh, then I would feel a little more confident. You know, I think last year they were able to solve those problems uh, once the trade deadline passed and they were able to get Ursula Silva and Marco Bellinelli, you know, off the scrap heap. I don't know if those type of players would be available, but they need to find some guys in that vein because, you know, losing uh, Covington, and uh, and Sarge, you know, uh, you do whatever you can to get Jimmy Butler, but trying to replace those guys, that, I think that's what they need. They still need to replace those guys if they're going to be truly among the elite in the East because right now I think Toronto and Boston are still separated from everyone else. I agree 100%. I mean, Ursan and Bellinelli, those those two made some big buckets um, and really contributed down the stretch last year, even when they had that winning streak and Embiid was out. Real quick, um, just two more on the Sixers. Uh, the move to me for Butler, you know, you always talk about change of scenery and, you know, a fresh start. He's got the good type of dog in him. But to me, you know, he strikes me as – I want the ball in crunch time. Like, I want the ball late. And and we know that Embiid wants to be down on the block at times uh, near the rim, and, and Butler's game is pretty much predicated at times to taking the ball to the rim. Do, do, going back to what I asked you before, can you foresee going forward in crunch time more plays kind of drawn up for Jimmy Butler? Because he's showing you that he's a closer. Yeah, he is. He's the most clutch player in the NBA right now, which is – a pretty uh, potent statement, but it's true. Um, you know, you can go down a list of everybody who you want taking the last shot, and Jimmy's better than all of them this season. So I think that you definitely – that's one of the reasons why they got him in the first place because in the past when they got to crunch time and they needed to create their own shot or get to get a good look, it was either going to be some kind of screen for J.J. Redick or some kind of hope and pray that Jill and me draw the foul and get to the free throw line. Um, but I think now with Jimmy Butler, they have a guy who can create his own shot – you know, create something off the dribble, not just for himself, but also for other people. So it was a great pickup, and I think that they'll have to find some ways to sort of, you know, spread the wealth a bit. But I think if you find a, find a way to work Joe, Joe in, those, in those situations, you also boost his confidence because, really, this team is about him. You know, <laughs> you know all the other pieces, they're, they're great, and they, they have a chance to really do something special. 
But if Joe Joe is a guy that really elevates this franchise and puts it in that conversation to be a contender, um, so you got to make sure that you involve him in those situations because he wants it, and you can tell that he's been hungry to be, you know, put in those positions. And you got to reward him for the work he's put in because he's clearly getting better every year. I made the joke uh, about two weeks ago that with all the Fultz issues and all the Fultz nonsense, can you imagine if the Sixers didn't trade for Jimmy Butler, how the fan base would react? I don't want to spend too much time on Fultz, but the one question is, how do you think this ends? Do you think he's going to have a career with the Philadelphia 76ers if they decide to trade him? Is there uh, is there is there value in Fultz? Is there a market for him? Or it, it has the diamonds just been done where the Sixers at this moment have to treat him as though, listen, we know you're part of the team, but you're really not part of the team, and we'll address it when everything else has worked out? Yeah, I just don't think that there's a future for him in, uh, in Philadelphia. You know, I just – I think that, you know um, – Whatever the situation is with his health, whether it's physical or mental, um, I think that you know, kind of taking your ball and running with running with it as he did this season, that doesn't sit well with teammates. It doesn't sit well with the, as a, uh, with the organization because I think they really did try to do their part to make it work out for him. His play didn't warrant more minutes or more opportunity than what he was getting, and I think that that's what's lost in all this. Is that you know he, he may feel like he was wronged and for getting benched and everything. But the opportunity was there, you know, and that's and I know that, you know, they, and they are not in a position where they can wait for him. You know, <laughs> Joe's ready to go. Ben's ready to go. <laughs> they can't sit back and say, well, we got to develop Markel Fultz. Or, right. Yeah. No, I mean, he's got to be ready, too. You know, he's got to elevate his game. He's got to put in the work in the summer. So when he shows up, he's ready to play. And um, and I think that's what's, that's what's lost in all this is that, you know, if, he, if the training staff, if the players – were aware of some ailment that was holding him back, and they, they probably would have been a, a lot more supportive, uh, or they would have given him time to get right. But to shut it down and to do it through the media before you do it to your with your team, that that that's the kind of stuff that that teammates look at you and they wonder what your motivation is, because if it's about winning and it's about being with us through this process, then you do it the right then way. Do you do it the right way? But if it's about you, then then you're really trying to burn bridges that that really don't need to be burned because these guys, I know these guys really care about him. They want the best for him. There's nobody on this team that doesn't want to see Markel Fultz succeed because they know that makes the team better. But when you kind of, you know, shrug or yep. turn your nose up at those attempts, you make it harder on yourself. No, it's an excellent, excellent point. Michael Lee joining us for a couple of moments on the Boardwalk on the Hotline, talking a little NBA with him. Stick with the Eastern Conference. Uh, surprised by uh, this Red Hat start by the Raptors 22-7? and seven. Um, am I surprised by the Raptors? Not at all. Um, I mean, I I think that. Did you know that Ka- when Kawhi would, I guess, let me rephrase it. Kawhi coming in right away, I mean, just monster having that instant impact with this organization. If he was the healthy, and if I, if he was healthy, I knew there was a possibility. You got to remember, it's a team that won fifty nine games yep. last year, and they didn't just add Kawhi Leonard. They had a Kawhi Leonard and Danny Green. Right. You know, I think that's what people kind of lose in all this is that they didn't just get one of the t- top five player MVP caliber player. They got one of the best three and D guys in the league, a guy who can spread the floor and shoot. So they upgraded, you know, the small four position, but they didn't really drop back in terms of what they needed at the shooting guard position with Danny Green. So um, the, that that trade that trade was 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 great. And not only did they keep, you know, did they get Danny and, and Kawhi, they kept OG on Anobi and um, passed out Siakam. And Siakam has been tremendous this year. I think that trade is going to stand out more for what they didn't give up than what they did, to be honest. Yeah, and, and listen, I like Green. I mean, you know, you got a veteran. He's a guy that knows how to play. He's a pro's pro, so to speak. You know, he's he's never careless with the basketball. That's another thing. And, and you know, how many times do we see in the NBA? Look at the Sixers, you know, with Simmons and, and all these turnovers. And sometimes when you're a younger team, you get careless with the basketball. You got teams that take advantage of it. You score points off turnovers. So they're playing sound basketball right now. Um, Boston, we're starting to see waking up a little bit. And I, I, I think people, you know, you can't, you can't put a nail in a coffin on an NBA team 20 games into the season. You just can't do that. And I think you're starting to see, okay, another couple weeks, you're, you're starting to see the Boston Celtics now six in a row, seven out of the last 10, kind of finding their footing after that slow start. Absolutely. And I think we all sort of expected this to happen. When you have this much talent and you have a coach as good as Brad Stevens, you know that the struggles aren't going to be forever. You know, they just had 
um, kind of get the commitment from guys who wanted to make it work, and I think they all did. You know, they knew it was going to be complicated because you have so much talent. You have so many guys who had enhanced roles last year after Kyrie and Gordon Hayward got hurt, and they had to take a step back and we had to incorporate all these pieces while also getting Gordon Hayward back up to speed and health. Um, so it wasn't going to be an easy task by in, in any means. And I think that, that when you have a shortened training camp, shortened preseason, it's going to be much harder to sort of implement things and get guys in a good rhythm. Um, but, you know, I think by the end of the year, we're going to be right where we thought they'd be, you know, right there in the Eastern Conference Finals, just because they have so much talent and so much depth. You know, I compare them to like a, a Wu-Tang Clan posse cut. You know, <laughs> you, you play it and, you know, everybody's going to come in and have yeah. their moment to shine, um, you know, but, you know, and that, that's sort of what happens. So right. I think they, they want to make sure that, you know, when they form like on it, it's going to be nice. So it just takes, it just takes some time. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's happening. It, it, let me let me throw this word out there: distrust. Is, is that kind of at the core of everything that's going on with the Bulls right now? I mean, you, you talk about dysfunction at its finest. I mean, that's just uh, it's an organizational failure. Yeah, it, yeah. it's not necessarily um, on the players or anything. It's just more they never really know what direction they want to go in, and they seem to change it. You know, through the course of the season, a lot of times. So I just think that when you look at Jerry Reinsdorf as being the owner of that franchise, he sort of looked at it as, you know, I won six championships with this <laughs> franchise, and I don't really love basketball. I got my World Series ring from the White Sox. I feel pretty good about that. And, you know, let me just focus on trying to maybe get Bryce Harper this summer. I really don't care what goes on with the basketball team. <laughs> good point. And I think that's really what happens. You know, whenever you have engaged um, ownership that really just committed to winning and allowing their, their staff to do what needs to be done, but actually cares, um, I think that you're going to find successful franchises. I, I think that, you know, Terry Reinsdorf has always been the guy that's going to let John Paxson do his thing. He stayed out of the way. But I think that that, that has been worked to the detriment sometimes because um, there hasn't been that full commitment and, and investment in putting out a quality product. And I think that you're starting to see that, and you're starting to see that every year whenever they change direction. So a lot of things are happening with the Bulls you got to remember, it's not just about the players who almost had a mutiny or the new coach who's trying to be a, a tyrant. It's all about the structure of the organization, and that all begins at the top. Uh, what's what's more impressive in your eyes? You know, LeBron w- with the Lakers right now and kind of teaching them how to win again, or you look at a team in the Dallas Mavericks where I think a lot of people thought was going to have a down year and – Right, right now they're fourteen and eleven. They're right there with Memphis. Another uh, surprise in the Southwest. I mean, what what team has been more impressive to you? There's so many, especially in the West. Um, I think just the way everything is sort of stacked there, where you know Houston is the fourteenth best team in the conference, which is right crazy now. to think were, about that. And they're yeah, they're one one uh, horrible uh, half of basketball away from going to the NBA Finals last year. Um, so I, I just think that just the competitiveness and overall parity of the league has really stood out to me. I don't really know who's good right now. You know, usually by 20 games, you can kind of pick and say, oh, Denver, yeah, OKC. Good. I mean, we know Golden State's going to be there in the end, but, you know, you look at uh, Denver over their last 10, OKC over their last 10 there. Again, uh, you know, these these. Teams yeah, are- I'm not, but the, do you expect the Clippers to be there at, at the end of the year in the top four? Or do you expect um, – you know, there's they're, they're going to be yeah, some teams. Yeah. They're going to like are the Spurs? Are they done? Is this going to be the end of their run? Um, you know, is, is, are the Rockets going to stay down forever? Um, I just think the surprise is just that you there aren't any definite L's. Like the Sacramento Kings, we forgot them. They've been a, a shocker. You know, I don't know if they're going to be able to sustain this pace for the entire year. But the fact that they even have a winning record at this point is just startling. Uh, I saw a stat a few weeks ago when they played the Golden State Warriors. It was the first time that the Warriors and the Kings faced each other. Where both franchises had winning records since 1979. Wow. And they lost that game by one. Yeah, so just think about that. I mean, that, that's what makes it all uh, amazing about the, the Western Conference this year is that there's just so much um, depth and it's all congested. It's hard for teams to really separate themselves. Um, I, I think we probably won't be able to figure everything out until the last couple weeks of the regular season because these teams are just going to be duking it out. And fortunately, there are some bad teams in the East they can pick on. Wow. You, you said 1979? Yeah. Wow. Got to go. Uh, Cheese Johnson was on that team, right? Uh, 
I can't even name who was on even one of those. I think one of their draft picks. Mar- Kansas City, uh, when they, when they, the Kings were there back then. They had John Lu- John Lucas was on that team. John Lucas, I think I, Parrish was on that team. Clifford Ray was oh, on that Warriors? team. Yeah, that yeah, seventy nine Warrior team. About, I'm thinking about the '79 Kings. Ah, uh, so. now I mean now I mean I, I'm <laughs> you're you're asking me to really uh, go back in my mind and yeah I I couldn't even I I, I don't even know I'm not even going to go that route. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll discuss we'll discuss that the next time. Uh, Thirty seconds before I let you get out of here. How bad are the Suns? Are we talking that this is a team that if they win ten games would be a miracle? I mean it's still in the NBA. You're gonna you're gonna get a team to trip up once in a while. They're gonna they're gonna win ten games. Uh-huh. Um, they'll probably win fifteen. Um, you know, I just think that you know they're they're bad. They they are bad. But somebody somebody has to take those L's in the West, and that's really what's happening. They're just not ready to compete at the level of these other teams. Their team is so young, um, so they're just gonna be the whipping boys until further notice. It's amazing how we look at some of these franchises. You know the ones Again, that bad yeah. ownership. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's just. I mean, you, you, the only time you'll find a, a bad ownership in a uh, that can be overcome is you have LeBron James. <laughs> That'll change everything. Wow. <laughs> he, yeah. he, he, he can negate. He can negate any kind of faulty ownership. It, it came to me as I'm letting you get out of here. That was the Kings at the time. They were Kansas City, right? Kansas City Kings. Yeah, the Kansas City Kings, my, oh, my, my theme. How, how about how about how about my man Ertis Boat's uh, Bird Song? Oh, Ertis Bird Song, yeah, yeah. Was he on that? I don't even know if he's on in '79, but I know he was. I think on he the might team. have been first or second he year probably, guy. First or second? Where'd he go? Houston. He went to University of Houston. Uh, I uh, know he was a top pick, but yeah. yeah, I don't remember what year. So. One of the best names in NBA history, Bird Song. I mean, wh- wh- you For know sure. he had a feathery touch, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I like the when they had Nate Tony Archibald too. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah, and Nate was a great player. Um, all right, my friend, listen, I, I got you for enough time. I I always appreciate a couple extra minutes. Uh, great stuff as always. Great follow on Twitter. We'll talk along the way. Appreciate a couple moments. All right, thank you. All appreciate right, you it. got him, Michael Lee. Uh, join us on the board. What kind of hotline?